in the close to 300 forums that we've had since 1995. This is the first forum we've ever held where a number of people called, not to ask about directions or if they needed tickets, but called to thank us, to just thank us for hosting Nikki Giovanni here. Oh, nice. and I And I can't tell you what a uh, quiet but very strong message that conveyed to us. Uh, she clearly has had a lot of power in people's lives. Uh, her real name is Yolanda Cornelia Giovanni, and why she would ever give that up, uh, <laughs> that beautiful lyrical name, um, is, a, is a mystery. Uh, she was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, and she started writing with a vengeance, or being published with a vengeance, I should say, in the 60s, and she's never stopped. Uh, in the 60s, when many people thought that the better path to equality might be politeness and civility, Nikki was uppity and in your face. She earned a reputation for being militant, outspoken, controversial, a truth teller. For four decades, Nikki Giovanni has continued to write, and the shape of her writing, the language, the topics, the focus have reflected her life's learning and experiences. She is no less commanding now than she was 40 years ago. She is more commanding now than she was 40 years ago. She is no less a truth teller. She's still edgy. She gives us all the wake up call we need, but she's also gentle and exuberant, wistful and witty. Her writing is still absolutely thrilling. And if you want to just bowl over your Valentine, look up her poem, Resignation. It will earn you bonus points for the whole rest of your life. <laughs> Uh, Nikki is the author of more than 14 volumes of poetry, two books of essays, and four children's books. She's received 19 honorary doctorates, which means a whole hell of a lot in academic circles, and many awards, including the Governor's Award in the Arts from both Tennessee and Virginia, the NAACP Image Award for Literature in 1998, and in 1996, the Langston Hughes Award for Distinguished Contribution to the Arts and Letters. In a kind of touch of irony, I think, she has also been named Woman of the Year by several magazines, including Essence, Mademoiselle, and Ladies' Home Journal. <laughs> that might not have happened in the 60s. She is currently Professor of English and Gloria D. Smith Professor of Black Studies at Virginia Tech. She is here tonight to talk about whatever she wants to talk about. I can guarantee you that. Uh, <laughs> But we hope she'll talk about her wonderful new book, Quilting the Black Eyed Pea, Poems and Not Quite Poems. And for the students here who will hear quite a bit about Rosa Parks this month, I particularly hope that you will read Nikki Giovanni's Rosa Parks from this book. Maybe she might read it for us tonight. I can guarantee you, you will never think of the Rosa Parks uh, situation quite the same way again. So with great gratitude uh, to her for being here, I'd like to welcome Nikki Giovanni. Thank you very much, and I, I do once again um, apologize, and I, <coughs> excuse me, I appreciate uh, everybody, you know, waiting. There's not much you can do about Andrea. I'm a big fan. I, I just want to say that for a minute. You know, it's so illogical that we move people by automobiles because it's, it's such a waste of energy. It isolates people. You never get to see anybody. And actually, the few people you see, you're agitated about them, so you're blowing your horn and, you know, doing things with your hands that are unattractive. And now the president and, 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 and all that craziness that he's going through is going to be fighting, you know, Saddam because, you know, what, we need more oil for the cars and what we need is more space travel so we can get an anti-gravity belt going. I'm a big fan of anti-gravity belt and you know it's possible. And, you know, just something you put on your... And you go on. Yeah. Especially up here because uh, it took us another 10 minutes just to get down this one street. I mean... It is. It's crazy, you know, but uh, that's not why we're here today. But I just thought I would, uh, I just thought I would mention that I am here for P, and I'm really um, excited. We call it P, Quilting the Black Eyed P. I'm really very pleased. 
uh, about the book because it was pretty and uh you know, sometimes you have books and you like the ideas and stuff, but the book is ugly. He's like, oh, God, you know. But she is pretty, so that makes me very happy. And I, I haven't been in Harvard for a while, and so um, it's always nice to, to come back to the Boston area. I like legal seafood and, you know, so <laughs> all the important things, you know, that, that, that happen. I'm kind of heartbroken um, right now because, uh, you know, we lost, uh, we didn't lose, but Columbia uh, broke up. And I'm really sorry about uh, Columbia breaking up because you have to sort of think, and I say this with no um, disrespect or anything like that, but, you know, somebody said, oh, we can get another, we can get another couple of rides out of it. You know, it, it's old. It was 81, right? And so, you know, it was time to retire. But, you know, little bean counters we got, they call themselves government officials, like, well, ride it one more time because we don't want to raise taxes. I am so tired of hearing rich people talk about they don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> I tell you what, I got a bunch of people, if you know anybody rich, I got a bunch of people who don't work, don't have jobs, not paying taxes. You trade places with them. That'll solve everybody's problem. They'll be rich, happy to pay taxes, and you'll be poor and can't. <laughs> no. It makes, you, it, it makes you crazy because, of course, I, I think the single most important thing that Earth is going to do in the 21st century is go to Mars. The Mars probe is extremely important. And I'm always dismayed by people who will be going to space for it because it's there, damn it. And <laughs> you have to go. You, you just can't sit on Earth as if, first of all, we need to explode the myth that this is the only life in the universe. That is so illogical as to not make any kind of sense to anybody. And this is not new. I mean, any of you that are reading me, you can go back to my first book. I'm going to talk about space is so important. And when you think about maybe the three important decisions, at least in my opinion, that, that maybe informed Earth. You see what I'm saying? One would be, of course, when Jesus let Judas kiss him and said to everybody, to, to, to I think it was James, take my mother home. I think that was like the number one decision that's going to inform a lot of what happens. The second would be when Socrates said, well, you know, what the hell, I'm going to drink it because I've been right and I'm not going to deal with you people. <laughs> You have to love Socrates, you know, you feel sorry for his mother because nobody wants to see your child go down, but you know, it's foolishness out there. <laughs> but the other one has to be Middle Passage. When, when, when the Africans who were being made slaves decided in the middle of that ocean that they were going to be human and humane. I got invited a couple of years ago to speak at Nats and I was so pleased, and that's the truth. I mean, I was just like elated. We got a call from my office and... and the lady runs my said, you know, NASA wants to know if you can come and speak. And I said, where? They said, the headquarters, which is in D.C. I said, yeah, you know, change, the, change my calendar. I mean, I'm so happy. But one of the things, and I think I should share it because many of you are young, one of the things that, that I know to be a personal strength, to be honest, is that I always know my moment. I always know where I am at any given moment. So when we got the invitation from NASA, I knew exactly what had happened. Somebody had said, February's coming. <laughs> yeah, face that one, you know. And, and I'm sure you know well, who's our Negro? I mean, we don't have a Negro. So we got to find a Negro. So I'm sure, <laughs> as you know, they do. I'm sure they went off to their file, their little end file, and flipped back. And <laughs> Somebody said, you know, because you know NASA don't know me what I do. <laughs> And it's like, well, let's get this one. So they invited me. <laughs> you have to know your moment or it makes you crazy. And you, you start to think you should be appreciated or you belong or something to make you crazy. You have to be very careful about things like that. So I, when I got all dressed up and everything, I prepared my remarks, and I started off. And you know how you can tell an audience, you know, that somebody said, it's February, get to the auditorium. And... <laughs> You know, you can see all of them, you know, because you know these things. So everybody's like, hmm. <laughs> and so everybody's like kind of pouting. And I went out, because, you know, some things you have to be oblivious to. I'm sure that many of us in this room know that. And so, you know, I went out and I'm so excited to be here because I think space is so important. And it kind of made everybody, you know, sit up. It's like, well, maybe this isn't going to be so bad. As I'm a, big, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the shuttle, which I am. 
And one of the things, if they had listened to me, which nobody listened to me, we would have had a second generation shuttle by now and working on the third generation shuttle. And some of this wouldn't have happened. I said, I think it's very important because my thing that I want NASA to do, and that's the truth, is I want what I call the 10% solution. I want every 10th person on Earth to have the opportunity to go in space. Now, I know that cannot happen because I'm not crazy. But if we shoot for every 10th person, what will happen is that every 10th person will know somebody who knows somebody who went to space. And if that's the case, we will change how we look at space and begin to view it in another way, which we need to do, because space is not populated by aliens out to get us or anything like that. There's something that we need to learn. So NASA actually appreciated that because that meant that they get a lot of tax money, whatever. And so they were like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> and I was glad because you like to make your audiences happy. And then I said, and I do. I think the most important thing that we do, that we will do, because it was a forward look at that point, in the 21st century is go to Mars. And I actually got a big hand. People are like, wow, I really like that. I mean, yeah, let's do <laughs> So we have to go to Mars for a lot of reasons. Number one is that you know Mars cannot come here. <laughs> no, we're crazy. And if Mars comes here, we'll kill them. <laughs> you know that. And then we'll kill the people that say don't kill them. <laughs> so you know that we have to go to Mars. And I said, and I understand because I do. I understand the problem for any of you who are physicists or things like that. I understand the problem with the Mars probe. The problem is very simple. It's a psychological problem. We do not know if what we send out to Mars will be what we get back. We do know that human beings do not do well without known landmarks, they, that, that once we put them in a, in a place that the rules are sort of suspended, they generally tend to go crazy. One always is reminded that, um, you remember the Andes crash several years ago? They ended up making a thing about a survival. I mean, no sooner that plane comes down and somebody said, well, how are we going to eat? Well, let's eat John. I mean, you know. So, <laughs> it's very unattractive, you know what I'm saying? But we have to recognize that. So, you know, we know that, that NASA needs to find a way to say how are we going to keep these people human. And that I recognize said, and I have the solution. So that was one of those grumblings, like, hmm. Because I do. The trip to Mars can only be understood through the history of black Americans because Mars is Middle Passage. And we're going to have to study Middle Passage if we want future on Earth. If we want to go forward, we're going to have to study it because people teach it. You all know that. People teach history as if the slavers went to Africa to get the slaves. Like the, you go to McDonald's to get a hamburger. Or, there were no slaves per se in Africa. Those were free people. They went to Africa to get free people to make them become slaves. It's a subtle difference, but nonetheless quite important. So the people in communities that were being stressed, that, that, that the grown-ups that were being killed, you know, you saw Roots. <laughs> it's out in DVD. But you know this? <laughs> if you didn't, you should. <laughs> but you know this? There's no way that they ever captured Wrestler. Because common sense said it don't make sense. Wrestler's too big. You have to kill Wrestler. You will never get him on the ship. You have to kill him. Kunta you can get because he's a, he's a juvenile. It's the old, how do, you, how do you get an elephant in the old days of elephant hunting? How do you get an elephant? You go to Africa because most of that's where you're going to deal with. You go to Africa and you have an elephant gun, right? And you go and you find the elephant community. And the bull elephant notices you and notices that you mean harm to his group. And he attacks you and you take your elephant gun and you shoot him. Right? Because nothing you can do with a bull elephant anyway. He's too big to get on the ship. There's no way to control him. You kill him. The women notice that he's shot and they try because the pachyderm does that to get them, to get him on his feet. Because it takes an elephant, as you know, a long time to die. So while he's down, they're trying to get him up, but they know they can't. So the alpha female leads the charge, and the women follow her, the older women, the grown-ups. And they attack, and they too, as you know, are shot. Now that's going to leave us with the juveniles. The juveniles are looking at the carnage. And like all juveniles, whether here in Boston, whether in New York City, whether in Los Angeles, California, without direction, but nonetheless protecting as best they know how their community, and the people left. 
they too attack. Mostly they are going to be killed also. And that's going to leave us with the babies. Now we can capture an elephant. But the baby has a decision. The baby is looking at the carnage. And the baby has to say to himself, should I just lie down and never get back up? Should I stop here? Because this cannot be done in my name. Or should I live to tell the story? Either decision is going to be a brave and a wonderful decision. If he decides, she decides, I cannot go on. My memories were not allowed. My dreams were not allowed. My nightmare, I will stop. Then, to one degree, the elephant's won. But if that elephant says, I must remember my people and what they gave to me, then they come forward. That's the way slavery was. Juveniles and children. And it is the damnation of our souls that we refuse to admit what we did. And until we do, we cannot heal ourselves. But those people on the ship, they were just kids, young people, trying to find who am I and how do I traverse this land. They found themselves underground. Some of you have been to Gory Island. You've been to Cape Coast Castle. There is a reason those ship, that, that the doors are low, because you had little people going through it. And they were rowed out to the ships, and they were packed in the ships. And they had to make decisions, because at first, they were old enough to look at that. They're 12, 13 years old. They said, well, that's, that's the way home is. They could look out, and they could see the heat shimmering off of Africa. As they went deeper west, they could look out and they could see the clouds above the land because they knew and you know and I know clouds above the land are different from clouds above the water. But they reached a point when they not only could not look back, they had no idea which way back was. And it was that moment that they had to make a decision. How do we go forward? They made a decision to be both human and humane. Because they had no ability to communicate with each other because the, they were broken up by languages, they made a decision to take that little moan, that worried moan your grandmother did, that little moan. And they used that moan because when they got here, they knew it wasn't going to be a good idea. I always hate the way the slaves didn't know what they were getting into. They damn well did. Your communities burned down, people are killed. They knew these were not nice people, just wanted to read a few Bible stories. They knew this was not going to be a good idea, but they had already decided on a choice of weapons. And those weapons have taken us into the 21st century. It is a brave and wonderful thing that they did. When we go to Mars, it's the same thing. When those people pull off, they're going to have to look back because they can see the blue planets. Like, that's cool. But there's going to reach a point that they can't. And it's at that point that they're going to need to know how did we do it. I'm simply submitting that the future of Earth resides in the hands of black Americans. I wrote a poem. It's called Quilting the Black Eyed Pea. We're going to Mars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to Mars for the same reason Marco Polo rocketed to China. For the same reason Columbus trimmed his sails on a dream of spices. For the very same reason Shackleton was enchanted with penguins. For the reason we fall in love. It's the only adventure. We're going to Mars because Perry couldn't go to the North Pole without Matthew Henson. Because Chicago couldn't be a city without John Baptiste de Sabo. Because George Washington Carver and his peanut were the right partners for Booker T. It's a life-seeking thing. We're going to Mars because whatever is wrong with us will not get right with us, so we journey forth, carrying the same baggage, but every now and then, leaving one little bitty thing behind, maybe drop torturing hunchbacks here, maybe drop lynching Billy Bud there, maybe not whipping Uncle Tom to death, maybe resisting global war, one day looking for prejudice to slip, one day looking for hatred to tumble by the wayside, one day maybe the whole community will no longer be vested in who sleeps with whom, maybe one day the Jewish community will be at rest, the the Christian community will be content, the Muslim community will be at peace, and all the rest of us will get great meals and holy days and learn new songs and sing in harmony. We're going to Mars because it gives us a reason to change.
If Mars came here, it would be ugly. Nations would band together to hunt down and kill Martians. And being the stupid, undeserving life forms that we are, we would also hunt down and kill what would be termed Martian sympathizers. As if the, that's the truth you know us to do, as if, as if the fugitive slave law wasn't bad enough then, as if the so-called war on terrorism isn't pitiful now. When do we learn, and what does it take to teach us? Things cannot be what we want, when we want, as we want. Other people have ideas and inputs, and why won't they leave? Rap Brown alone. We're, the future is ours to take. We're going to Mars because we have the hardware to do it. We have rockets and fuel and money and stuff. And the only reason NASA is holding back is they don't know if what they send out will be what they get back. So let me slow this down. Mars is one year of travel to get there plus one year of living on Mars plus one year to return to Earth equals three years of Earthlings being in a tight space, going to an unknown place with an unsure welcome awaiting them. Tired muscles, unknown and unusual foods, harsh conditions, and no known landmarks to keep them human. Only a hope and a prayer that they will be shadowed beneath a benign hand. And there is no historical precedent for that except this. The trip to Mars can only be understood through black Americans, I say. The trip to Mars can only be understood through black Americans. The people who were captured and enslaved immediately recognized the men who chained and whipped them and herded them into ships so tightly packed there was no room to turn, no privacy to respect, no tears to fall without landing on another, were not kind and gentle and concerned for the states of their souls, no. The men with whips and chains were understood to be killers, feared to be cannibals, known to be sexual predators. The captured knew they were in trouble in an unknown place, without communicable abilities, with a violent and capricious species. But they could look out and still see signs of home. They could still smell the sweetness in the air. They could see the clouds floating above the land they loved. But there reached a point where the captured not only could not look back, they had no idea which way back might be. There was nothing in the middle of the deep blue water to indicate which way home might be. And it was that moment when a decision had to be made. Do they continue forward with a resolve to see this thing through? Or do they embrace the waters and find another world? In the belly of a ship, the moan was heard, and someone picked up that moan, and a song was raised, and that song would offer comfort and hope and tell the story. When we go to Mars, it's the same thing. It's middle passage. When the rocket red glares, the astronauts will be able to see themselves pull away from Earth. As the ship goes deeper, they will see a sparkle of blue. And then one day, not only will they not see Earth, they won't know which way to look. And that's why NASA needs to call black America. They need to ask us. How did you calm your fears? How were you able to decide you were human, even when everything said you were not? How did you find comfort in the face of the improbable to make the world you came to your world? How was your soul able to look back and wonder? And we will tell them what to do. To successfully go to Mars and back, you will need a song. Take some Billy Holiday for the sad days <laughs> and some Charlie Parker for the happy ones but always keep at least one good spiritual for comfort. You will need a slice or two of meatloaf. And if you can, and if you can manage it, some fried chicken in a shoebox. <laughs> With a nice, moist lemon pound cake. A bottle of beer, because no one should go that far without a beer. And maybe a six pack so that if there is life on Mars, you can share. <laughs> Popcorn for the celebration when you land while you wait on your land legs to kick in. And as you climb down the ladder from your spaceship to the Martian surface, look to your left, and there you'll see a smiling community quilting a black-eyed pea watching you descend. <laughs> looking for um, language, which I haven't quite found. Seven years ago, I had what I'm now referring to as a cancer um, experience. And I'm going to use a bad term here because I'm a survivor. I don't believe I'm a cancer survivor. I believe I'm living with cancer. And I know that 
Nobody fights cancer. I remember all those people. You know, I, I remember when I went to the hospital, Mickey Mantle went to a hospital. And Mickey's last words were, I want to beat this thing. And it was like, no. I mean, you have to learn. You, if you could beat cancer, you wouldn't have it, you know. And, you know, it's just so American, isn't it? And whatever the hell's wrong with you, I'm going to get it. <laughs> it's, just, it's, 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 it's so unattractive, you know. It, it really is. But I had this thing. I couldn't breathe, actually. I just had a lot of trouble breathing. And I teach at Virginia Tech, and you go up the steps all the time, so I'm sweating. And it's, you know, it, it's really hard, and I'm saying something's wrong. So I go to see my doctor. His name is Kenneth, and he's a really nice guy. And Kenneth said, you know, your blood pressure is up, because that's all they ever do is they take your temperature, you know, they weigh you and your blood pressure. And actually, he's taking the measure in you, and I'm not sure what that's about. Cause I, you know. But he's like, your blood pressure is up. And I was like, well, I don't think that's it. He said, yes, sir, you know, your blood pressure's up. And he gave me some pills. Now, I'm, I'm from the school of, of, of medicine that says, give me a shot. If something, you know what I'm saying? If something wrong, give me a shot. Because when I grew up, you got a shot, you went home, you got well. Now everything is pharmaceutical, right? And you have to take pills for 835 days, and it costs you a fortune, and you know better off than if they had given you a shot. But I took my pills, and I did them, I did, and then I still couldn't breathe. So about a week later, maybe 10 days later, I'm back at Kenneth's office. He was I said, Kenneth, I, I think something is wrong. He said, well, you know, your blood pressure is up. And he did. And I, I think it was a prejudice, to be honest with you. He, he said, you know, you've been eating too much salt. And I think he just said, because I'm a black woman, he think, you know, black women all eat salt, you know. And I don't eat salt. I don't like ketchup. I don't do fast. I just soon eat you know, camel's pisses as eat fast food. Cause it's, it is, it's so awful. And I was like, Ken, I don't think that's it. So he finally said, well, let me take an x-ray. Maybe your heart's enlarged. I said, okay, you know, take an x do, do something. Yeah, I'm paying you. And so, you know, you hold the thing and he took the x-ray. And many of us in this room are women, so you're going to understand what I'm going to say next. You know how your girlfriends call you? And, and you can hear it's this tone, you know, you ask the phone, hello, you know, you're in a good mood. And it's your, one of your good girlfriends, and she's like, girl, can I tell you something? And you hear the tone. And you know what she's going to say to you is something that you already know, actually. You know, she's going to tell you something about your, your boyfriend, somebody who he said, you, you're sleeping with him, you know he's got somebody else. You, you know, you didn't need her to do that. But it's that little snide kind of, you know, come here. And Kenneth had that tone, Nick, he was because me, Nick, uh, come here. I said, Kenneth, I don't want to see it. He said, it may not be as bad as you think. I said, oh, yeah, it's as bad as I, I mean, of course it's as bad as I think. I'm not lucky. And that's the truth. <laughs> no, some people are, you know, in life, that's the truth. In life, I won one thing, I tell you, and that's the truth. My, father, my grandfather married a pretty woman. My grandma's a pretty woman. And she had a lot of mouth. And grandpapa went to the stores in the market, these are old days, because he knew that grandmother, somebody would say something to grandmother, right? Grandmother would come back and say, John Brown, the butcher wants me to come back and meet him after dark. He would be, of course, honor bound, because they're Southerners, to go up and shoot the butcher, right? <laughs> you know that's going to happen. Then the butcher's going to be upset the people that came to him, going to come back, they're going to lynch grandpapa, burn the house, that ugly things would happen. You see what I'm saying? And my grandfather's very forward looking on things like that, so he said, Mother, I'll do the shopping. So she never went. <laughs> <laughs> She never went to the store. Well, I think my mother got in the habit that men should do the shopping because my father did the shopping. So it made sense, right? But Kroger's opened a new store. I go to the store all the time. I signed up, right? I'm the one that filled out the thing, right? But my mother and I do share a name. That's where, I mean, Yolanda's my mother's my sister came up with Nikki, and I don't know why. Nobody knows why. She's only three years old. But I signed up. Why Giovanni, right? Of all of the days the store is having its grand opening, my mother goes to the store, sees Y. Giovanni up on the board as having won a prize, went and got the prize. No one... She did. No one damn well she hadn't signed up for anything. I came to the store, saw Y. Giovanni, went to the manager, said, I'm Y. Giovanni. He said, no, Y. Giovanni's been here. I was trying to argue, and I thought about it. I said, my mother, I went home. I went, because I wasn't living home. I was living in my own apartment. I went home. I said, Mommy, what, you know, you went to Kroger. She said, yeah, and I won a prize. I said, that's my prize. <laughs> you know, it was only a loaf of bread, but it was the principle of the thing. <laughs> it's the truth. So I was really, like, upset. You know, she wouldn't give it to me. 
Sure, I know I'm not lucky. This thing that he is looking at, you see what I'm saying? I know it's cancer. I said, Kenneth, you're just a family doctor. His name is Kenneth. You're just a family doctor. Get me a surgeon. He said, it may not be operable. I said, Kenneth, I'm a black woman. It's operable. If I have to take cuticle scissors and cut it out, it's operable. <laughs> now, I'm going to try to live, you know what I'm saying, with the cancer. But this thing here is out of control. So you have to, you know, send a message. Like, I'm not going to take that. You know, you can have little clumps all around, but nothing big and ugly. You know what I'm saying? It's trying to kill me. So Kenneth did what he's supposed to do. We did a bunch of that stuff, but nonetheless, he had a doctor lined up. But everybody said, I called my attorney because she's a wonderful woman. I called my attorney, and Gloria said, you need a second opinion. I said, I know I need a second opinion. She said, well, come to Cincinnati. I'm in Blacksburg, Virginia. She said, come to Cincinnati for your second opinion. And I'm sure you know that because, you know, you all are in a good school up here. And, you know, you cannot get your second opinion from the same place you get your first opinion. You have the same opinion. It won't teach you anything. So I just thought I'd mention that for those of you who have <laughs> So I drove on over to Cincinnati, and there's a crazy man there who was so wonderful. His name is Creighton Wright. And Creighton is an old friend, and, and he was just going to give me a second opinion. He said, oh, wow. He said, Nick, have you seen this tumor? I said, Creighton, I have looked. I said, it looks pretty bad. He said, oh, you know, he said, I do so many operations. I never get good tumors, you know. He said, he's crazy. He said, you know, I want to take it out. I said, Creighton, I have uh, an appointment next Friday with a surgeon, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, but he said he had a Jewish hospital in Cincinnati. I said, I, everybody tells me, because we did, uh, actually Mass General was one of my consultants on this, and, and I said, everybody says that I need to, you know, take care of this, because from the time Kenneth discovered it to the time it was removed was 20 days, and so, you know, you need to, to keep moving on it. And he said, well, how about tomorrow morning at 10? Would that be soon enough for you? And I said, well, yes. <laughs> I was late because Creighton is a very good, uh, and he, he made me laugh about the whole thing. So he did. He took it out. And, of course, you know, you, you're always very grateful. And now I'm in the hospital, right? I've been paying my HMO what they ask, right? I didn't set the rates, right? They ask, I paid. Now I'm now in the hospital, and my HMO is saying she's been in the hospital four days. We're not going to pay anymore. But what they don't know is Gloria Happer is my attorney. She's been with me for 30 years, and Gloria's crazy. <laughs> That's true. So Gloria did her homework, and Gloria called the HMO because they're about to kick me out of the hospital. I do remember, because you're, so you know, you're just doing so many drugs at that point to just make your body because they took the lung and two ribs. But I just remember I had this vision of Gloria bending over me saying, no matter what you hear, it's going to be all right. And I, I was comforted by that. But Gloria called the HMO and called the woman who's been denying me service. And she said, you know, I'm Gloria Haffer. I represent Nikki Giovanni. And she said, well, Dr. J. Call me Dr. Giovanni. He's been in, in the hospital, and, you know, we're not going to pay. She said, that's, that's fine. She said, I just wanted you to know, though, I know where you live. <laughs> she said, I know where your children go to school. Both of them. She said, I know where your mother lives. And so now the woman is like, is she going to put a hit or, you know, what a <laughs> So the woman did the right thing. She said, well, th th maybe Dr. Giovanni should stay in until the doctor releases her, which made sense. If they had put me out in February, right, they may as well have shot me. I'm missing a lung. I'm missing two ribs. I got no way to defend myself in 20-degree weather or less, right? You may as well just shoot me. You don't put somebody out of the hospital like that. And what makes me mad is I think it's a damn shame that you have to have a crazy attorney in order to get adequate medical care in the United States of America at the end of the United States. I was in the hospital for about a month, and so I came, finally came home. A friend came over and got me and took me back home, and I did what people do. I got in bed, and my mother lives right down the street from me now because she has moved, everybody's moved into Blacksburg, and so mommy's fixing breakfast for me every day, and that's really nice, but it finally dawned on me, stop this. You're not sick. Sick is a cold. I had a cold last week. Sick is a cold. What you've had is an experience with cancer. This is who you are. You have got to get out of this bed. Because if I don't, I'm going to become some kind of invalid. I have to tell you, if you've never had a major operation, it's painful. Because it's just painful to put your legs on the floor. And you break out into all of these sweats. Then you get to the bathroom, finally brush your teeth. And you're still, you know, just like crazy. I mean, it, 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 everything hurts. And in my bedroom is my grandmother's couch. And so, yeah, I sat down on the couch and just, you know, gathered myself. Then I finally could get into the kitchen where Mommy had fixed breakfast. Having worked that hard to get out of bed, I was unwilling to go back and get in bed. Now, many of us in this room are not black because all the black people are going to understand what I'm saying next. I need to explain a couple of things for those of us who are not black. In every black woman's home, there is a space called the living room. 
<laughs> so I, I know you all know. That. <laughs> you only go in the living room. <laughs> On Saturday morning, <laughs> when you dust it. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't go into the living room. It's just, it's a, it's a huge no-no. And what, what you do is, you know, if you die, then the minister comes. Or if you get married. That's the only other time, right? You know, you know. <laughs> but I had worked so hard to be up. I started sitting in the living room. Now I'm hearing my mother on the phone to her friends. Nikki's dying. <laughs> I'm sitting right there. And I know what they're saying is, you know, why do you say that? She says, she's sitting in the living room. <laughs> but of course, what I actually got was my first miracle, in my opinion. Because I'm sitting in the living room, I'm looking at it's spring. And two robins came, mother and father, robin, Mr. and Mrs. Robin. And I was looking, I was like, wow, I wonder if they're going to build a nest because they're actually going to do it on my train plane. And the next morning, I said, I wonder what the birds are doing. And I came up, and of course, they had decided, which was so lovely, to build on my drain pipe. And so every morning now, and I did a very human thing, which is so ugly of human beings, I started to say, I wonder what my birds are doing. But of course, they weren't my birds. The birds most likely were saying, you know, I wonder how our human is coming, <laughs> is coming along. But they built a nest, and they had babies. And anybody thinks that Mother Robin doesn't have any trouble passing her egg, has never seen her pass her egg. The egg is to the robin what a baby is to us. You know what I'm saying? And the birds hatched, and they went away. I'm forward-looking, and so I don't like ants. That's not true. I hate ants. <laughs> and I'm, you know how you're noticing because you're sitting there. And I started reading up on birds. And, of course, one of the big problems, and I share this as... If you're on Jeopardy, you may need to know this. <laughs> one, of the, one of the big problems with, um, with, with baby birds, and especially little blind robins, is that the ants will crawl up the drain pipe or crawl up the tree or whatever, and of course they'll eat the bird alive because there's nothing mother bird, you didn't know that, can do about it. <laughs> yeah, it's very unattractive. I work at Virginia Tech, and so I call Tech because I'm just going forward to try to you know, protect what I'm now calling my birds. And I called, we have a thing called Extension at Virginia Tech. And I called Extension and I said, I'm Dr. Giovanni from English, you know, I've got these birds and I want to know how to protect them from the ants. And they said, we have no idea. And I said, oh, yeah, you're at Virginia Tech. I read your ads. You tell me you know everything. And <laughs> this is my number. Call me back when you figure out how to protect my birds <laughs> from the ants. Because I know they can. They just don't feel like it. You know, they... Looking at the March Madness or some crap. <laughs> so I got a call back about two, three days later, and they did have the solution. And this I share since I always try to do something useful for my audiences. <laughs> In order to protect baby birds from ants, an ordinary flea cow collar. Just pop the flea collar, and if it's bigger, put two together and wrap it around. The ants won't crawl over the flea collar, right? And it doesn't harm the birds. So I just thought... So now you know, when you fall in love with some birds, that's what you should do. Just help them out there, right? I just thought you might like to know that. I wrote a poem, <laughs> which I consider in many respects my cancer poem is called A Robin's Nest in Snow. Outside the window of my den, where I sit, usually counting clouds or airplanes or chipmunks scurrying by, on a snowy day, I still see the nest with the flurries. Snowflakes are so delicate. They melt on your tongue, sit proudly on your shoulders, tangle themselves in your braids. Last spring, I didn't know a bird had made a home in my river birch. There was activity, but I thought it was the crepe myrtle. Only when the tree exhaled did the light reveal itself. The snow piled up neatly, filling the crevice, hopefully destroying the viruses and bacteria that can attack the young, still blind robins. And I, a survivor of, of lung cancer, nestle hope in my heart that no harm will remain when spring and birds return. Very briefly, the modern civil rights movement was started by the murder 
of a young man named Emmett Till. And 10 weeks after Emmett Till's body in August was discovered, Rosa Parks said no. And all fairness to everybody, I think that it had to be Rosa Parks because you can't love people if you don't know them. And a part of loving black people is understanding us. And, you know, if it had been Coretta King, everybody would say, how come Martin didn't take her? What's she doing on bus anyway? <laughs> That's the truth. And if it had been Mrs. Abernathy, oh, Ralph should have, you know, given her the car. It had to be. I just thought I'd mention it because you know it's true. It had to be. <laughs> No, I love us, but you know that's the kind of way we look at things sometimes. It had to be Rosa Parks because Rosa Parks, which everybody forgets, is a, well, she was a projects girl. She was living in the project. Mrs. Parks' front door looked into the back door of E.D. Nixon. Mrs. Parks turned 80 now six years ago, and I was invited by the Detroit City Council to participate in it, and I wrote a, a poem for her. I've written about Mrs. Parks before. And I wanted to find a way to start it where I thought it started. So actually, in dealing with Mrs. Parks, I started, of course, with the Pullman Porters, because America would be an extremely different place without the Pullman Porters and without the sleeping car, a brotherhood of sleeping car porters, without that union. If, if that union had been broken, there would be no unions in the United States today, which is why John L. Lewis, whom we all recognize to be a racist because he was, supported it because he recognized he had a common interest, and that was very, very important. The Pullman Porters are all over the history of, of, of black Americans because it's the Pullman Porters that are always going to carry the Chicago Defender down to Mississippi or the uh, uh, Pittsburgh Courier, the orange paper, all the way through South, uh, South Carolina, all the way down to let people know they were not alone. Of course, these were dangerous activities because if they had been caught with those papers, they would have been fired if they were lucky, beaten if they could handle it, and maybe killed. Depends on how, how crazy things uh, would ultimately get to be. The Pullman Porters, as we know, were bankers of the civil rights movement because the Pullman Porters were the only people seeing everybody. So when the race men like Thurgood Marshall needed money, the Pullman Porters would talk to the, the blues men who had it, and they would pass it along. And you know there was never a penny ever not gotten to where it should have gotten to. And it says something about the quality of those people. It was a wonderful thing that they did. And it's going to be a Pullman Porter who was, in fact, going to bond Rosa Parks out because E.D. Nixon was a Pullman Porter. It was the Pullman Porters who were going to overlook, or look over, I should say, a 14-year-old black boy from Chicago in the summer who's going down to Mississippi to visit his granduncle. I had a son, and, and many of you in this room are sons, and there's nothing on earth that's more frightening than a 14-year-old boy being left at home in the summer. This happened to be a kid who had uh, polio. And so what he had was a doo-wop bark because he had a limp, so he would do that thing to drag it. And that's what, you know, black men used to do that all the time. You know, they had that little doo-wop. And he had a stutter. But the Pullman Porters, I'm sure, saw him when he got on the train in Chicago. And he's going to roll the reverse of the Blues Highway, for those of you who have studied the Great Migration. You know, the Blues Highway starts someplace in Louisiana and runs all the way up. He's going to roll the reverse of it. I'm sure the Pullman Porters looked over him like they looked over us, like they looked over everybody. And I'm sure as that train pulled out of Chicago, they saw him. He was a cute kid. I've resented all of those people that try to make him some kind of grown man. He's a 14-damn-year-old little boy. And 14-year-old boys look like 14-year-old boys. He's sitting over there, and I'm sure he had his shoebox because we never traveled without it. had his chicken, whatever else, you know. We used to have a, well, everybody did because you weren't allowed to eat in, 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 in the food car. And I'm sure as, that tra as the train pulled out, and one of the things that I always loved with trains was when you could look out the window and see it going around the track, and then you could see the, the engine in the front or the tail. You know, it depends on which way you It's like wonderful. And I'm sure knowing the Pullman Porters, they were saying, you know, son, come on, I'll show you the back of the train. I'm sure wonderful things like that happened. They got down into uh, Springfield, Illinois, and I'm sure they said to him, now, son, you don't want to get off here in Springfield. This is a home of the Klan. And I'm sure he didn't. The, 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 the train rolled all the way down, you know, to St. Louis. So I'm sure that they said, and here's, here's the mighty Mississippi, son, look at that. I'm, I'm sure it was a wonderful adventure. They got to Memphis, and for those of you who know that area, you know, in the old train days, you could look over and just about see where Beale Street was. And they said, that's the home of the blues. And actually, if Emmett could have stayed on that train, he would have gone on down to New Orleans. He would have taken the Sunset Limited back to Los Angeles, taken the Cardinal, gone all the way up, come all the way back over on the northern train, and boom, written a wonderful story because we know he's a good storyteller. But when we got to Greenwood, Mississippi, you know, Emmett had to get off that train. And when he got off that train, whatever happened, whatever it was, all he did was to say something. Nobody ever said he tried even to do something. He had his baby fat. He said something. And, and J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant took 
exception, and that would understate it. At 2 o'clock in the morning, they went to Emmett's granduncle's home, Moe's, right? And they knocked on the door and said, we want that boy from Chicago. Emmett had a cousin there visiting from Chicago, and Moe started playing for time. He said, I have two. And they said, we want the boy that did all that talking. An amazing thing. Two grown men in the middle of the night want the boy who did all that talking. And somebody said to me, why do you care about Tupac Shakur? Because he's just another boy who did all that talking. Because if you can't at least talk, then what, what do you have left? Emmett didn't do anything. They took him out, and everybody said you could hear his cries all up and down the Delta. They castrated that child. They ended up knocking a piece of his skull out. When he was found, his eye was hanging by a thread sitting on his cheek. His nose looked like somebody had taken a cleaver and just done it in half. I mean, it was such a savage thing. They, they, even they recognized this should be hidden. And so what they did was they went and got a gin for him, Milam and Brian and, and the three or four other people who were with them who still should be charged. You know, Emmett's mother just died last month, and she died without any justice for her son. But at least she knew for the 47 years that, he, that she was alive after he was murdered. She kept this story going, and we will continue to tell the story of him because it's an important story. They put a barbed wire and hooked it to a, a, a gin fan and dropped him in the Tallahatchie. Everybody had hoped that it would be over, but the body came back up. His mother had gone immediately, had started for Mississippi. When the body came up, it was about a week later, the sheriff said to her, we don't know, this, this isn't your son, we don't know what this is. And she said, it's my boy. That, that's, that's, that's my son. He said, well, you, you don't know that. You can't prove that. You, first, <laughs> I'm a mother. Some of you are parents. She didn't have to. That was her boy. But he also had his father's ring on, Emmett Lewis Till, E-L-T. He had the ring on. But she didn't need that. That was her boy. And what she saw had to be the worst thing that any mother could ever see. It's one thing to lose your child because nobody wants to lose you all. But it's another thing to know how he must surely have suffered. And she decided she wanted that body home. The sheriff said, no, we're burying him here. But for those of you who know the area, in Greenwood, Mississippi, there is a funeral home called Century Funeral Home. It's about a thousand yards from the railroad tracks. And it was the Pullman Porters who went to, who was now Miss Mobley, and said to her, what would you like? She said, I want him at home. I said, we will, we will get him home. We will do that. When the train, the northbound train came through, they stopped the train. And from the funeral home, they brought Emmett's body aboard. They didn't put him in baggage because if they had put him in baggage, the body would have been found. And if that body had been found, everybody that saw that body would have been killed because everybody recognized this was a monstrous thing. They put him at their personal effects so that they could watch over that child and got him to Chicago where his mother opened the casket. Everybody said to her, you know, you need to close that casket. Aren't you ashamed of how he looks? But, you know, it wasn't her shame. It was the shame of the people who did it, and they needed to see. But, you know, I'm always amazed because I'm sitting here with a lot of women in this room, and it's not just a woman thing, but a lot of women in this room. Some of you have abusive boyfriends, and they hit on you because they get drunk or they say they get drunk, but whatever it is, they hit on you. And you have black eyes, and you have bruises all up and down your body, and you are ashamed that this has happened. It's not your shame. It's this full shame that you're trying to love, and you need to give that shame back because it's hard enough to deal with your own shame. You don't need to take on somebody else's. I wrote a poem about Rosa Parks because Mrs. Parks was not tired. There was no difference between December 1st and November 30th. She worked every day. She did the same job every day. She got on the same bus every day, played the same dime every day. And I am sick of that one. It is so boring. Oh, she was just tired to hell. If that's the case, she was tired way many years before that child was murdered. She was a committed woman who has led and continues to lead a committed life. I wrote a poem, Rosa Parks. This is for the Pullman Porters who organized when people said they couldn't and carried the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defenders to the black Americans in the South so that they would know they were not alone. 
This is for the Pullman porters who have Thurgood Marshall go south and come back north to fight the fight that resulted in Brown versus the Board of Education. Because even though Kansas is west, and even though Topeka is the birthplace of Gwendolyn Brooks, who wrote The Powerful, the Chicago Defender sends a man to Little Rock, it was the Pullman porters who whispered to the traveling men, both the blues men and the race men, so that they would both know what was going on. This is for the Pullman porters who smiled as if they were happy and laughed like they were tickled when some folks were around, and who silently rejoiced in 1954 when the Supreme Court announced announced its 9-0 decision that separate is inherently in unequal. This is for the Pullman porters who smiled and welcomed a 14-year-old boy under their train in 1955. They noticed his slight limp that he tried to disguise with a doo-wop walk. They noticed his stutter and probably understood why his mother wanted him out of Chicago during the summer when school was out. 14-year-old black boys with limps and stutters are apt to try to prove themselves in dangerous ways when mothers aren't around to look after them. So this is for the Pullman porters who looked over that 14-year-old while the train rolled the reverse of the high blues highway from Chicago to St. Louis to Memphis to Mississippi. This is for the men who kept him safe. And if Emmett Till had been able to stay on that train all summer, he would have maybe grown a bit of a paunch, certainly lost his hair, probably have worn bifocals and bounced his grandchildren on his knee, telling them about his summer ride in the rails. But he had to get off that train and ended up in Money, Mississippi, and was horribly, brutally, inexcusably, and unacceptably murdered. This is for the Pullman porters who, when the sheriff was trying to get that body secretly buried, got Emmett's body on the northbound train, got his body home to Chicago, where his mother said, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And this is for all the mothers who cried. And this is for all the people who said, never again. And this is about Rosa Parks, whose feet were not so tired. It had been, after all, an ordinary day until the bus driver gave her the opportunity to make history. This is about Mrs. Rosa Parks from Tuskegee, Alabama, who was also the field secretary of the NAACP. This is about the moment Rosa Parks shouldered her cross, put her worldly goods aside, was willing to sacrifice her life so that that young man in Money, Mississippi, who had been so well protected by the Pullman porters, would not have died in vain. When Mrs. Parks said no, a passionate movement was begun. No longer would there be a reliance on the law. There was a higher law. When Mrs. Parks brought that light of hers to expose the evil of the system, the sun came and rested on her shoulders, bringing the heat and light of truth. Others would follow Mrs. Parks. Four young men in Greensboro, North Carolina, would also say no. Great voices would be raised, singing the praises of God and exhorting us to forgive those who trespassed against us. But it was the Pullman Porters who safely got Emmett to his granduncle, and it was Mrs. Rosa Parks who could not stand that death. And in not being able to stand it, she sat back down. A lot of people don't know it, but Oprah doesn't like me. Doesn't. Actually, it's mutual. But, um, <laughs> well, a couple of years ago, there was a, a skater named Tanya Harding. Yeah, the trailer trash. And she was having this thing, she is, and she was having this thing with um, Nancy Kerrigan. And she had a boyfriend named Jeff Galuli. And Galuli went and attacked Nancy Kerrigan. Right? And of course, they caught Galuli and he went to jail. Well, not only my question, but a lot of people said that, you know, what part did, did Tanya Harding play in Jeff Galuli's actions? And everybody said, oh, you know, he acted on his own. And I just happened to mention, you know, that Jeff Galuli was nothing but a white stedman, and you know that he doesn't. Uh... <laughs> She took exception. <laughs> and it's very obvious to me. <laughs> anyway, I get this call. <laughs> well, you know he wasn't. Stephanie wouldn't do anything without her approval. But I got this call from Gail King, who's Oprah's best friend. I think Oprah's only friend. But uh, <laughs> 
because O Magazine is doing the body, you know, and they wonder if I want to write a poem. Well, if you don't know anything else about me, you know I'm a political poet. So I'm saying to, you know, I'm talking to the people in my office, it's like, mm, Gail King, but they just, you know, going to try to humiliate me or something, because, you know, people stew about things like that. And I said, oh, and I thought, well, what the hell, I'm going to do it, because I called her back and said, I want the feet. Because different people did the body. I don't know if you saw that issue of, of oh, the magazine. But some people had to skin hair. One woman had the penis. And, you know, they, which was interesting. She was like, it's so nice to have a penis around the house. I thought, well, <laughs> I thought it was stupid, but, you know. I wrote this poem. I didn't really, I thought they were going to reject it because I, they don't ever do political kind of things. But I wrote a poem. It's called The Song of the Feet. It's appropriate that I sing The Song of the Feet. The weight of the body and what the body chooses to bear fall on me. I trampled the American wilderness for its frontier trails, outran the mob in Tulsa, got caught in Philadelphia, and am still unreparated. I soldiered on in Korea, jungled through Vietnam, sweated out desert storm, caved my way through Afghanistan, tunneled the World Trade Center, and on the worst day of my life, walked behind JFK, shouldered MLK, stood embracing Sister Betty, I wiggle my toes in the sands of time, trusting the touch that controls my emotion, basking in the warmth of the embrace Days Inn's offers with warm, salty water. It is appropriate that I sing the praise of the feet. I am a black woman. Nina Simone recently, she hadn't been around uh, in a long time, and I went down to Constitution Hall, which I was so thrilled to be in Constitution Hall. I actually had a reading once in Constitution Hall, and I was so thrilled. I, I would have, you know, paid them to let me do it, you know, just because of Marion Anderson. But I went to see Nina, of course it was sold out, you know, but Nina has that expression, I'll take, you know how she talks, I'll take that applause. So I, <laughs> I thought it was really cool. It was so good to see Nina. If you could just wait for a microphone so that people who watch this later on can yeah. pick up your question. I read your poem about uh, dedicated to Tupac Shakur, and I was wondering who you think uh, had shot him. I don't know um, who shot uh, Tupac. Thank you for the question. I, I, I can tell you who I, I, I don't ever believe shot him. I, I don't like this campaign against Biggie, who's also dead. I don't believe that... Uh, the, Los a the Las Vegas police couldn't find a white Cadillac going across the desert because it, it's outstanding. And I have no faith that um, this government under which we are living, in that case it was another president but the same government, uh, is not perfectly willing to kill anybody. I mean, the same person, in my opinion, killed Tupac, killed John Lennon. You know, uh, it, it, it's been a lot of deaths in, in, in that. And I just know that I won't buy into the sort of turf war that they're trying to sell. But um, in other words, we did it. I wrote a poem in here, he blew it, you know. Um, there has to be some responsibility taken for what they're not knowing. But, but Tupac um, was, was um, a marked man in many respects because he still stood for something. And the proof of the pudding being in the eating, I know that if Tupac Shakur were alive, Eminem couldn't exist. And there are, uh, no, that's true. And uh, Eminem is somebody's baby. Somebody's making a lot of money because I remember I'm 59, and I remember that a lot of people died so that Elvis Presley could emerge. And so I just see the same thing now. Somebody said that, that, that this crazy fool is up for some kind of Academy Award. But see, I remember a crazy bitch named C. Dolores Tucker, who, <laughs> that's the nicest that I can say, because I, <laughs> I know that there's some teenagers here. But she went down to Congress to Henry Hyde, who was one of the big time reprobates in the world, to testify against Tupac Shakur and what was then called gangster rap. 
right? Eminem comes up, he's screwing his grandmother, he's killing his wife, he's beating, you know, look at, look at his, 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 his lyrics. And everybody says, oh, that's just the artist. So we know what, you know, it is. Sure. If Tupac had said anything like what he said. So I don't have an answer to who because the pinpointing is, is no more interesting to me than I just, it's, it's the atmosphere that I, that I, that I want to deal with. Somebody will find out because you, you have Tupac to be killed. You have Suge to go back to prison. Interscope took over death row. Suge finally gets out of prison. There's no money in death row at all, right? So we know, you know, we know that this was a hit. This was an assassination that, you know, they shot Kennedy and King, whoever shoots. It looks very much right wingy to me, but um, it does, you know. And Dexter King, let me just say this because nobody may ask me about this. <laughs> you know, Dexter King is, is, is having a low-grade fight, and I hope that he continues it to stop the uh, J. Edgar Hoover building from being named after J. Edgar Hoover. He wants to change. And I think that that's important because J. Edgar Hoover was an awful human being. He was a liar. He, 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 he undercut people. He did, he did illegal things, and that building should not be... That should no more be the J. Edgar Hoover building than there should be the Reagan Airport. I mean, how cynical can we be? Well, my name is Francisco Cruz from Carmen Academy Charter School in Boston. I was wondering, what's your favorite line in the Ode to Tupac? I don't have a favorite line. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm a high school student at um, English High School, and um, I've heard a lot of poets, a lot of writers. And I want to know what inspired you to be a writer, a poet, you know, and so on. Well, I, I like storytelling, and I'm sure you can tell that. And I'm an Eastern Tennessee, and I'm an Appalachian, actually, because I was born in Knoxville, grew up in Cincinnati. And a part of what we do is talk. And I think I was very fortunate with that because in Knoxville, Tennessee, for the longest, television didn't come on. And I, I, I like TV, but I think I've been a beneficiary of not having television to suck my imagination away from me. So I grew up with books, and I grew up with time. And time is important. You have to be a little bored. Everybody keeps kids busy. And uh, that's not a good idea. And I know that I have a lot of high school students in here, and I'm sure we're all very ambitious and want to make our parents proud and things of that nature. But you've got to take a subject you can't pass. <laughs> you do. Because otherwise you're taking super subjects that you're being bored with. You've got to push yourself beyond that because everything can't be an A. Because then you get to college, you make a B, you kill yourself. <laughs> it happens every year. It happens right here on any of the various campuses. And somebody, to, you know, thought they were smarter than they were. You need to learn that you can survive. You can learn something that 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 isn't going to, you know, immediately benefit you. And you can go forward. And you can live with a C or a D or an F for that matter. You have to give yourself an opportunity. <laughs> Royce Stone Martinez, School of Education. I just I thank you um, for coming. Um, I read your Racism 101, and that really inspired me and gave me energy to continue because I was going to leave this place because my soul was tired. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what advice do you give to students of color or students in general to get through a place like this that does not foster and nurture who you are as a person of color, that does not notice your experience and your theory? Because you have not written something and it is quoted that you are not valid when I believe my experience is my theory. What advice do you give to people like myself or in general to make it through this? Well, see, first of all, I'm just a poet, so I don't give advice. <laughs> be fair about that. And secondly, I don't know where you think you can go in America that you're going to be nurtured for who you are. <laughs> what world are you living in? And I'm not knocking it, but if you have to be upset and unhappy, this is a real good place to be because it beats... No, face it. I, you know, the bitching and moaning doesn't work for Harvard and, and, and BU and stuff because there are people at Tougaloo, there are people in, in Waco, Texas, there are people that don't have any facilities. And you all say, well, do nobody understand me? Nobody understands anybody. So I don't want to, you know, necessarily hear that I'm, I'm uninterested. I think that what's important to you is that you find somebody who loves you. Because there are prejudiced people here, whether you're at the Harvard or wherever school you are, there are going to be prejudiced people. I don't care where you go. The problem is if you go to a black school, they're prejudiced, then you say, niggas are crazy. If you come up here, you think you can correct. 
And what I'm saying is it's always important to have somebody who loves you. It's very hard because people don't want to discriminate. Everybody wants to treat everybody the same. I had a teacher. Now, this is, this is why I write, because I tell stories. And so y'all can, you know, I had a teacher when I was in the third grade. Her name is Fanny Pearsall. Actually, Fanny's a friend of my mother's. And she had to go to a meeting. Was, I went to uh, St. Simon's because it was a little private school. And she had to go to some kind of meeting. And she said to the class, be quiet. I have to go to the meeting. Read whatever, right? And, of course, I remember because I know my, you know, Gerald and Harold and, 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 and Charles Black and John Eden all started talking. I've always been very dutiful because I don't like people saying things to me. Isn't that something you know? Something you have to take my word. I don't. I really dislike it. So if I know what you said that, you, that I should do, and there's nothing more at stake than me just not having to hear you, I'm going to do it. Okay? <laughs> now, if it's important, I'm going to speak it. But, you know, what the hell, you in the third grade. So I sat there. <laughs> no, but I remember this. I sat there and did what I had been told to do. Now, the fact that the rest of the class was talking was not my business. I'm not their keeper. None of my business. But when Ms. Pearsall got back, she, the class was making noise. She said, I'm going to give everybody a swat. And so she started going through the room, swatting everybody's hands. In the days, you could swat people's hands. And when she got to me, I said, Miss Pearsall, I was not talking. And she said, well, Nikki, I'm going to swat everybody. And I said, well, my mother, who taught down the street, I said, my mother is down the hall, and I think I should go see her because I don't think this is what we want to happen, you know? And, because I, I didn't. I didn't want to hear it. She said, well, you can go see your mother, but you have to come. I said, right. Well. So I went down to see Mommy. I said, you know, and, and everybody did know. I wasn't talking. Mom said, I don't know if I can interfere. I said, but it's not right that I have to get swatted when I wasn't talking. She said, well, Fanny, listen, it's swatting everybody. I said, I, I wasn't old enough to say, I'm giving them. I said, but I, I wasn't doing it. And I'm saying this to say you have to discriminate. Somebody here loves you, right? She did, by the way, if you want to know the end of that story. I had to come back, right, because I couldn't let my mother down, and I couldn't let my mother be in a position of interfering. So she did. But it was a very gentle swap at that point, but it's something that I remembered. And when they finally had Nikki Giovanni Day in Cincinnati, <laughs> Fanny was there. And I, I don't carry grudges, but I did say, do you remember that day that you hit her? <laughs> But I wasn't, you know, upset. I mean, I was glad she was on the program and stuff. I'm saying to you, <laughs> it's true. You have to find the person that loves you. Be a man, be a woman, be black, brown. You have to find the person that cares about you because we do, and I'm using discrimination, not as against, but for. Somebody wants your forward progress, and you have to figure out who it is that's helping you and who it is that's not because you can't throw a net and say these people, because these people mostly don't give a damn. These people are trying to figure out a way to get their raise. Some of them don't like you because you, you know, black or because you're overweight or whatever it is that people don't like you for. But most of them don't really care. So you want to find that person that can help you. Don't throw, don't, don't toss a wide net here. Just keep looking for how do I get through. And I say this to black students all the time because I just did a, a, my oral history, you know, I'm part of that project now. And they said, well, what do you, you know, if, if if, if one thing changed, what would make you not? Because I'm, I'm very forward looking. And I said, you know, if I had to lose faith in black women, I think I wouldn't want to live. And that's the truth. I, I just have such faith in black women. So I always know who I answer to. And I know that wherever I am, I am never going to be alone because all of those ancestors are there. And you have to figure, you have to know that somebody dreamed of you. Because look at where you are. Somebody in 1621 was saying, as my great-grandmother would, never mind. You remember, I was, never mind, going to be a better day. And you represent that better day. And you've got to take strength from those people because they came through so much for this better day. One day, this day will be as backwards as we know it to be. One day, 200 years from now, people are going to look back and they're going to say, well, what did he do? And you want to say, he stood fast. He did what was in front of him. You can't let the future down, and you can't let the past down. So you have to find a way to draw on that strength. Don't let these people turn you away from the people that dream that you could do whatever it is. You, you owe your allegiance to somebody else. You're not here to change these people. You're here to answer those people who gave their lives and their best spirits going forward. Thank you.
Uh, hi, my name is Tiana Harris, and I'm from Newton Country Day School. And um, I was just curious about what you thought about America, well, the idea that America owes um, African Americans 40 acres and a, and a mule? Well, they owe reparations, there's no question about that, and, and it's an ongoing discussion. They owe reparations because our ancestors gave an honest day work, they did not get an honest day's pay. If they pay reparations, everybody will be happy. It's a win-win situation. You want to jumpstart the economy, give the money to poor people, they spend it. <laughs> it would make us a little sane. It would be good. I'm, I'm a big fan of reparations because I know it'll be helpful. So before somebody said, well, how are, you, how are they going to spend it? None of our damn business. Is their money? Very last question. Very last question. Oh, I won't vote for Al. I don't have a problem with that. I would have voted for, I voted uh, Green last, uh, last election because I couldn't vote for Gore and MMS also. It's too crazy. And so if Al is running, I'm going to vote for Al. One, the White House will rock. <laughs> It'll be a lot more. No, it will be. I'll get invited. <laughs> Go out. You know. I think it'd be fun. I hope that. I do. I hope that they're not allowed to cut what they call third party candidates out. Because it's third party candidates that keep the d discussion going. And you, we know what's going to happen. Bush and whoever he's running against are going to say, we're major candidates. We don't want to talk to those other people. But there's no difference between them. And so it's very important. And I wish Al well. Somebody's worried about Al because they burned his office down. So he's obviously doing something right. He'll look as good on a stamp or a dollar bill or whatever as any of the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.